1330 WEBY, Northwest Florida's Talk Radio. This is your turn. A live call-in show featuring spirited discussion and debate about issues that matter to the community. Stay with us to hear what Northwest Florida thinks. Better yet, call in at 623-1330 and tell us what you think. It's your turn here on 1330 WEBY, Northwest Florida's Talk Radio. Now, here's the host of Your Turn. Good afternoon. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Renee Giacchino. I'm corporate counsel for the Center for Individual Freedom, and I'm hosting this version of Your Turn, the program that I've dubbed Meeting Nonsense with Common Sense. To learn more about my organization, you can find us on the web at www.cfif.org. If you happen to be seated at a computer, I want to encourage you to bring up the website, firstladiesman.com. That's firstladiesman.com. Because, yes, folks, we have joining us again this afternoon, he himself, the first lady man Andrew Oak my friend Andy Oak and Andy is the author of two books uh, there are two separate books titled unusual for their time on the road with America's first ladies we have volume one and volume two both of which are excellent and very easy reads belong in every home every school and certainly in every political office as well I think that they teach us a lot about the importance of the relationships that the, our presidents have had with their first ladies. And here to share a little bit more uh, in light of the fact that this happens to be the week of the Valentine. Yes, Valentine's Day is Wednesday. I thought it'd be very appropriate to have Andy come back on and talk with us about the love affairs and maybe not so much love uh, between our presidents and their first ladies. Uh, Andy, welcome back. Thanks for joining us. Renee, it's always a pleasure to be here. You know, you say, you introduced me, I think, who's that guy? He sounds pretty good. You talk, you talk me up really well. <laughs> I appreciate it every time. Well, it's funny because when I pull up your website now, I look at the picture and I think, who's that guy? I mean, that clean-cut picture. I was so used to for so long seeing the picture of you with the beard on your motorcycle right in front of the White House. I think that picture still is. Um, you know, on your website, but it used sure, to be, sure. I think, very visible front and center. So, yeah, we both can be a little tricked once in a while, right? Well, it's, it's funny that, that volume one, we had all the bearded presidents, so it seemed only fitting <laughs> that I had my beard for that picture. I've still got the motorcycle, and now I'm now I'm running clean cut for volume two just to keep everybody guessing. Well, volume three, I hope we'll have some females in there. I'm not sure what you're going to do for that. Maybe we'll see you in a dress. Well, they, <laughs> I'll do something interesting, I can assure you. But but there is just a little sneak. I don't think this is too much of a spoiler in Volume 2. I do address the issue in the Hillary Clinton chapter because first, first gentleman, but Bill would not have been a traditional first gentleman in that he's a former president. I think you and I have talked before that had uh, Carly Fiorina done better, you know, that, that Frank would have been a more traditional in that he held no public office and he was a... Uh, non-political spouse to see what a first first gentleman would look like in the modern world but i i hope and i'm i'm fairly certain we will we will get that chance sooner than later and and yes that that gentleman will will have a a, a chapter in my future books but i will remain the first ladies man because who wants to do another trademark right there you go well um and and it's interesting because i i remember back in that chapter where you talk about you know what would he have been called um, yeah. Should Hillary have won, and 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 I think you know you're right. It would have remained Mr. President. Exactly, and and that's why I mean you know we know we're getting a little off track, but it, he, I, I firmly believe that he would have been the first former president to be a, a, a Secretary of State or a Deputy Secretary of State. I mean Hillary wouldn't have wanted him anywhere near her Oval Office because of the power struggle, and he's the second pilot and put him out where he's most effective and most known on the international stage, but. That's, that's for a different chapter in, in Volume 2, and people can read that on their own. Well, let's talk uh, crossing both Volume 1 and Volume 2 of Unusual yeah. for Their Time on the Road with America's First Ladies. And folks, you can pick it up at Amazon, you can pick it up at Barnes & Noble, you can even get it through his website. Um, let's talk about the love affairs um, between the presidents and their first ladies. Um, Starting with probably what I, at least, you know, from having my kids having done History Fair and most familiar with going back, you know, the furthest in my mind of, you know, where I first saw tribute paid to a first lady mm-hmm. starts in my mind with Abigail and John Adams. Am, am, am I skipping over people who shouldn't be? Well, I, you know, there, there, there's only one really to skip over, which right. I do think was a true love match with Mar- Martha, Martha Washington and 
George Washington says that, that he couldn't think straight without her by his side. And, and he had her travel to, to uh, nearly every winter encampment of the Revolutionary War. She was a confidant. She took care of him. And I, I think that, that there was definite love there in, in their life together. But, but it was on my second trip of this journey for the C-SPAN series and, and of my studies and research that when I was in Quincy, Massachusetts, you know, I, I realized these are real people. Um, they, they were not always oil paintings, and they were not always chapters in history books. And, you know, they were teenagers just like everyone else. They had to date before they got married. And the earliest letter I was shown in the Abigail and John Adams relationship was from 1762, an October 1762 letter. And John actually addresses the letter, Miss Adorable. That was his nickname for her. And I thought, yeah. It, this was just this was just not what I was taught in history. This is not what I was taught about these these women, these people, and and they were they called each other sweetie or Miss Adorable or this. And the letter gets, I mean, for the times, it's kind of it's kind of steamy. It's, it's kind of uh, scandalous. He says, "I want to come over after the hour of nine o'clock and steal as many kisses as I can." And I'm a pretty good kisser, as I've given thousands before, though some have been unreturned. I mean, you know, there's the flowery language of the day. But it, it's a mash letter between two people in love, and they want to get together and make out. It, it, it's that, that simple, and that is not what I pictured when I looked at John Adams and Abigail Adams in their official White House portraits. But later on in life, even going to, to the opposite end of their life together, in a letter to Thomas Jefferson, John Adams writes to him in, informing his good friend that, that Abigail had died, and he says, if only I could lie down beside her and die myself. Aww. And it's just, it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful to think of these romances outside of politics that formed. I mean, they were a great political uh, power couple, but probably our first. More so, I mean, Martha Washington was a fantastic woman and, and, and the greatest supporter, and I write very clearly that America wouldn't be America without her. Had right. George Washington married anyone else, she helped facilitate his upward mobility through society and through the ranks, and gave him the ability to go out and create this country. Um, but but Abigail and John, uh, John sought out a political career advice from Abigail, and, sh and she gave very, very, very sound advice, uh, uh, stuff that would be relevant today. So, so I always like to start with them when I'm talking about the the, 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 tr the true loves of the White House, because theirs was, was so clear and, and written in the written form. Well, it's so interesting in the written form, because, you know, you, you, you had access to thousands of letters between them. Yeah. I mean, you know, you probably wrote some love notes in your day. I probably wrote some love notes in I my day. I still do, Renee. I <laughs> still do, I'll tell you. Well, I, I don't expect anyone to save those or to have saved those. It's pretty yeah. remarkable that those were all saved. And, well, and, and in that time, because, you know, the, the, the colonial, uh, the, 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 um, the, 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 the version of cleansing your hard drive back in the day was burning your letters. Right. And most people did. There, there's only one letter known to man in the world that is written in Elizabeth Monroe's hand, and it's a letter she wrote to someone else. <laughs> it's condolences for, uh, for, for a, a family friend who died. She uh, Elizabeth writes to the to the man's daughter and talks about what a great friend this man was, and, you know, wishes her well and sympathies and things like that. It's pretty what you would expect and, and appropriate. But uh, Elizabeth had her on her deathbed had her husband James Monroe uh, uh, burn all the letters, and Martha Washington burned all her personal letters up in the third floor where she remained after uh, George Washington's death. And, you know, history burns before our eyes. But the the Adamses were unusual. They, not not to you know pinch my own title off my book, but they were unusual for their time. And even back then, they knew to go against social norms and save these letters. And the Massachusetts Historical Society, where I read those early love letters, and, and even the, the late letter that I mentioned, um, they have 70,000 pages of four generations of Adamses that were kept in this family library. Wow. And it's, it's remarkable to think that they had the foresight to keep these, even even against what, what society would have said at the time was, was inappropriate. Uh, speaking of inappropriate, this was something that, that I did not know, that, that John and Abigail Adams were cousins? John and Abigail were cousins. Uh, that's what I meant, Abigail. I'm not sure who I said. John and... No, and no, you said John John. I, I have, I, that's a new one on me. Okay. I, I, thought, I, I, I thought I recently read that... Um, you, and, now, and, I know who, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt and Franklin Delano Roosevelt were cousins. They oh. were six cousins. 
Uh, Eleanor, here's a here's a love story. This fits right in. Well, they they the family kind of didn't approve of it. But it was kind of like we can't keep these two crazy kids apart, so we might as well embrace it and go with it. But but FDR was a mama's boy, and his his mother Sarah did not approve of the wedding at first. But then she was the one that wouldn't let them get divorced because once they were married, a Roosevelt never got divorced. But Eleanor's father was Theodore Roosevelt's brother, and he kind of went. He had an opiate problem and some drinking problem, and he was in uh, an insane asylum recovering from this addiction. He tried to kill himself. He jumped out of a window, and the fall didn't kill him, but complications from the fall did. And that left Eleanor without both of her parents because her mother had died previously. And so when she married her sixth cousin, when Eleanor Roosevelt married her sixth cousin, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, President Theodore Roosevelt walked her down the aisle because her father had had died. Oh, bless her. Yeah, heart. it's sad. You know, the Eleanor Roosevelt story is 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 kind of sad. She she if you look, I, she's not thought of as one of our. There's Favorites. no other way to say it, better looking uh, <laughs> first ladies. It, it's not, and people make fun of her all the time. And look, we all we all get old. We all aren't what we used to be. Whatever. I get that. You go back and you look at the letters when or the pictures rather when FDR and Eleanor started dating. She is a she's a wonderfully attractive woman. She's very attractive. And, and and her family thought of her as very plain and openly called her the ugly duckling. She'd lost both of her parents by the time she was a teenager and raised by her aunt and her grandmother and shipped off to finishing school in England. And, you know, she, she, she turned out to be one of the most influential first ladies and just so kind. Everyone I meet in my travels who has a personal experience with Eleanor Roosevelt cannot say enough nice things about her. Include, this one woman at a speech came up to me and said that she went on a class trip to the United Nations in New York when she was in eighth grade or something, and she got separated from her class uh, looking for the restroom or, or something like that. And I can get, I can you know relate to that because I was a wanderer, got lost everywhere I went. <laughs> so she went around a corner, and she was trying to find her class coming back, bumped into Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor Roosevelt basically gave her a private tour of the United Nations building until they could catch up and find their class, and that's one of many, many stories of people who had personal run-ins with us. Well, let's turn our attention, if we may, for... Well, actually, I have to take a quick break. Uh, sure. I'll pay some of the bills. But when we come back north into Vermont, and I want to yeah. talk about Grace Anna Goodhue and her love relationship with Calvin Coolidge. It's a great story. So, folks, we'll be right back after the short break. We are talking with Andrew Oak. He's an award-winning TV producer who traveled the world in search of provocative stories. He then documented all of those, and you can read them in Unusual for Their Time, On the Road with America's First Ladies, Volume 1 and Volume 2. We'll be right back after the 